Welcome everyone to our farm scale composting workshop. Our presenter today is Jeff Andres, chair of Yahara Pride Farms Incorporated. Um, he's the board. He's on, he serves as the chair on the board of directors, which in this uh, Yahara Pride Farms is a farm-led, not-for-profit organization working to improve soil and water quality. Thank you, Jeff. So thank you for having me and thanks to the sponsors for sponsoring this segment of, of the conference. Uh, when Stephanie first uh, approached me about speaking, um, she was ta talking about the composting and she sharing some things uh, with, the, with the conference. And after I committed, she said I needed to talk for 90 minutes. So hopefully I've got enough information here and, uh, and good information that keeps everybody energized and, and uh, um, into this program. And, and uh, hopefully we all can uh, get something out of it. Uh, we've been doing this for a while, and, uh, but, uh, you know, still a lot to learn. So um, Andrus Berry Ridge Farms is, uh, I'm in uh, the, uh, uh, would be the fourth generation. Um, farmers or third generation, yeah, fourth generation, moving to the fifth generation. Um, this picture here of the farm uh, was a, the house in the original dairy barn was built by my grandpa in, in uh, 1913. The land has been in the family since, <clears throat> excuse me, since uh, uh, the late 1800s. Our farm is, uh, is located in the Yahara watershed and as uh, my bio says uh, we, uh, we also chair the Yahara Pride Farms farmer-led organization uh, with the uh, uh, where we uh, try to uh, improve uh, water quality as well as soil health in this region, working directly with the farmers. And, and uh, we've been in existence since 2012, and the organization has had some great success. Our farm is located in the northwestern part of the, the watershed uh, with the state capital uh, right in the center of the isthmus of the five lakes. Um, very good farmland in this area. Uh, also very, uh, very, very uh, populated area as well. Um, vast majority of the farmers are dairy, mostly in the northern part of the, the uh, watershed. Southern part of the watershed is more, more uh, cropland and uh, more, uh, more, maybe some more of the beef and swine down in that area. Andrus Berry Ridge Farms, three equal partners, myself, my brother, Steve and Randy and their families, uh, milking 500 cows, uh, approximately 400 heifers, 1100 acres of land, uh, grow alfalfa grass, soybeans, wheat. Um, I guess we also sell genetics uh, registered herd of cows, um, have some high genomic cows. Um, we've all showed, all three families have showed at the local fairs and the Dairy Expo. So uh, well-rounded farm. Uh, one of the things that uh, we concentrate on the farm is being good stewards of the land. Uh, we use a lot of cover crops. We do a lot of minimum tillage. Uh, our housing of our livestock uh, calves uh, up to six months are in group pens. Uh, we bed with primarily corn stalks, ground corn stofer. That corn stofer is normally chopped twice before we bale it. So um, it's not lo overly long and stringy. Uh, it's sized and uh, particle size, uh, um, you know, three to four inches. Um, we do use a little bit of wood shavings with the calves. Heifers that are seven months and older are then introduced to free stalls. And we are bedding with uh, ground corn cobs and sawdust in those uh, stalls. And then all our lactating cows are, uh, are uh, on sand bedding. Um, six months, uh, all the manure is, uh, I should say the manure to six months uh, and younger and older manure is, is all, the, all the manure from the heifers from baby calves until they have their first calf is now being composted on the farm in one way or another. Uh, the manure that 
from the heifers that are in the free stalls is hauled daily to a local um, uh, um, what am I to say? In a local manure digester, uh, where they harvest the methane out of it. We bring back the separated fiber, and that goes into the composting process. Uh, we have enough liquid storage for six months for the lactating cows. What is composting? And this is a very basic uh, definition, uh, and it's combining carbon and nitrogen sources together uh, and decay the decomposition uh, uh, of the organic matter into a simpler form by introducing these two two uh, sources together and uh, by the decaying organic materials then is used for uh, plant fertilizer. It's been around for centuries. Why farm, farm scale composting? Number one thing is just drink volumes and concentrate nutrients. You also kill pathogens and break down carbon, the carbon bedding and you make nutrients more available to the growing crops. And one of the reasons you are making it more available is by breaking down the carbon bedding, which normally in some cases takes up nutrients out of the soil to break it down in the field. Can be an alternative way to handle manure other than liquid uh, because the composting process uses a lot of moisture. Um, you, can, you can use, you can take some higher moisture manures and introduce it to the composting process, uh, minimizing the amount of liquid storage. Um, one thing that is uh, became very evident in our research and the work that we've done here is that it converts the soluble phosphorus in manure to a more stable particulate form that binds to the carbon in the compost, therefore making it a safer product to take to the field when you have runoff events. It doesn't tend to move as quickly off the field. Uh, manure, po uh, manure composting in windows is also an alternative way to store and stack manure, um, utilizing your headlands and your fields actually for the storage versus uh, 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 a manure pit or a structure. Allows a wider window for applying livestock nutrients back on the field. Um, we got more ability to spread on, on growing crops in the summertime. Um, a lot of times when you spread liquid manure, it's a fall and, and, and spring application, only a couple weeks to get it done. Uh, compost allows us to get that nutrients out there. Yet, uh, more often, uh, more days of the year than say liquid. Compost has a less, less risk to enter groundwater because of the organic nitrogen, uh, tends not to move as easy, and better avoids potential water quality issues by minimizing the risk of runoff. Better utilization of nutrients in the farm system. This is something I learned early on is now we have all this nutrients that we have tied up out in our farm field. Some are higher than others, and some fields get manure uh, more often than others in the form of liquid manure. This way we can get manure out to those fields that don't, for instance, if they're highly erodible, we can get manure to those fields more often in the form of compost, therefore using the higher fertility fields of the farms to actually feed the lower fertility fields in the farm. History of, a, of composting on at Berry Ridge Farms. The first uh, time I uh, was approached about composting was uh, our tenant. We have a hog facility that we rent out. It was the summer of 2000, uh, 2014. Got a little misprint there. Um, PV, PEDV uh, was moving through the country at that time, and they no longer could render um, uh, mortalities. Uh, so they were looking for an alternative way to dispose of their mortalities. And they approached me about getting some cornstalk bedding um, to make some windrows to embed the, the mortalities in to, to compost them. And uh, I said, I could do one thing better. I could supply them with a, all the bedding pack manure they wanted. And therefore, um, 
we started that process and I was amazed after a month's worth of time of that mortality being in that windrow, how, how it disappeared with very minimal smell or, or attraction of flies. The summer of 2015, we were awarded a SARE grant and managing summer, we were managing summer packed, uh, bedding packed manure strictly in the summer. Um, we, uh, we received the grant to offset some costs and experiment with composting um, with two other local farmers. And that was to, to help understand a little bit more about what we could do with uh, composting. What were some of the alternative? Um, well, first of all, could we make good compost? Second of all, what are, the, what are some of the things we could use the compost for? One of them was uh, potentially some livestock uh, um, bedding at, at some point and at a certain point of the, of the process, uh, as well as we moved some compost off the farm to another farm that did not have a history of uh, manure or, or compost in their farming operation. In 2017, we received a community grant to continue composting and, and to build, we also built a new heifer facility and compost shed. So the idea of that grant was more on the water quality side of things, being involved with the Yahara Pride and our organization and the community. Uh, this area is very concerned with the five lakes of the water quality and what comes off these farm fields, mainly in the form of phosphorus. We were wondering if there was a way we could uh, potentially make compost, move that nutrients to farms that need it. And our, our, our uh, watershed is a perfect example with the livestock being in the Northern part of the watershed and very few livestock in the Southern part of the watershed. How could we potentially work together and move that nutrients from the farm, from those livestock, heavy livestock areas to areas that are not getting manure and or organic fertilizer. 2018, we designed and built a compost turner uh, with a local uh, equipment uh, manufacturer, or I should say a fabricator welding shop um, that complemented our composting process and allows us to be much more efficient. 2019, we worked with a number of different carbon sources in our manure. Uh, we we uh, did a trial with the MMSD, the Madison Metropolitan Sewer District, uh, with some of their Class A biosolids. We worked uh, with some with grass and straw, um, bedding pack manure, separated fiber, all those types of carbon sources. And we did a study as far as how how, how they performed in the composting process. 2020, we started working with local, the local manure digester to allow us to increase composting to all our livestock, which I said earlier, uh, other than the milking cows. And what that really did was allowed us to um, get a little additional moisture out of that manure before we introduced it to uh, the composting process. And now we have all of our young stock manure is being, being treated or you could say being processed through the compost system. Currently, we continue to try other ideas that might add value to the agronomic value of compost and uh, how it performs in the field. Again, the SARA grant, uh, we, uh, we, the outcomes uh, or the idea of it was to improve the long-term sustainability of each farm through the marketing of value-added soil amendments and moving nutrients out of the phosphorus-impaired watershed. Uh, we did that uh, with that trial. We had one of the farms that, uh, again, we hauled the finished compost to a farm in the southern part of the watershed that did not have a manure history. And uh, we had seen some, some results there. Uh, we also um, were looking at the uh, possibilities of using it for bedding. 
and the the trial included a daily temperature, carbon dioxide accumulation, uh, moisture percentages, visual evaluation uh, of the leachate and runoff and the steam generated. And one of the things that we are learning with the composting out in the fields uh, on headland stacking or field edge is there's very little leachate. And, and that is very important as far as uh, worrying about contaminating, contaminating groundwater. Um, it seems like the, the compost, when you're turning the compost regularly, it actually um, burns up that extra moisture in the water. In a lot of cases, actually draws moisture out of the ground. As I said, we, uh, we learned in the Sarah Grant that at a certain point in the process, three or four weeks in, that the compost uh, was in a state that we thought it would actually make pretty decent bedding. At that time, it probably was turned four or five times, uh, had good pathogen kill, and we used it uh, in our freestalls for our heifers. Uh, one of the problems we had, though, uh, because we did we only scrape once a day our freestyle alleyways. We had some issues with hairy hoof warts with the with the heifers. Uh, they were drawing a little bit too much moisture into the into the free stalls, and it seemed like those hairy hoof warts flourished. Um, in our facility, at, at at the end of the day, uh, it didn't work well for us uh, as far as car, cow comfort. It was great. I think in a situation where you had alley scrapers or a uh, slatted floor, I think this could be a pretty good uh, potential practice or at a minimum being able to mix that with another carbon source as bedding. The community compost grant from 2017 to 2018 was funded and received through the Clean Lakes Alliance, uh, worked with UW-Madison on the research side of things. Uh, evaluate the potential runoff of P loss on farms during the manure composting process and the application to crop fields. This is where we found out that there was a transition from, from, from soluble phosphorus to particulate phosphorus that binds to the carbon within the compost. Uh, that was uh, something that uh, we didn't realize prior to this, and, and uh, we feel it's pretty beneficial for the environments. Uh, again, we, used, we also use bedding from the six months and younger, the corn stalks, uh, straw, uh, some wood shavings, a little bit of sand mixed in some of that as well. We, uh, we were able to um, get a little better handle on the expenses of what it was actually costing us at that time to do the composting process that I'll be sharing later. The outcomes of the, grow of the compost grant, the summary, the growing awareness of the spreading of packed manure on melting snow is not the best way to manage and use nutrients in the manure. So the idea of this was, could we take manure off the farm fields at particularly this time of the year when people are needing to get manure off out of the out of the pens that's thawing, can we put it into a windrow and turn it into compost rather than spreading it out on the fields where it is highly um, uh, soluble phosphorus would uh, potentially move with the melting snow and get into our waterways. We also learned that the compost dries down, saving a lot of, a lot of hauling costs. Uh, we're generally seeing a reduction of anywhere between 40 and 60% in volume. We also learned that composting, compost could be spread on growing crops like alfalfa hay. And through our yield monitors on our chopper, uh, where we harvest the, the uh, hay, we were able to see uh, a little bit of a yield bump. Um, I was looking more so to see if we'd see a yield drag if we were doing any damage. So being that we've seen a little bit of a yield bump and we could detect it with our, our own yield monitoring, I felt pretty good about that nutrients being used out on the hay fields. 
The other concern when you put it on hay fields is you want the pathogens to be reduced. You don't want to be reharvesting pathogens, uh, especially pathogens that potentially could lead to herd diseases like yonis. Uh, again, the compost uh, was more flexible for land application. And now we have the potential of selling off the farm or some of our excess nutrients. Headland stacking, a convenient way to start composting. Um, you could you could headland stack this time of the year. Um, another way of being uh, uh, minimum by another way to minimize the risk of nutrients leaving the field, and it would just be a matter of bringing in the compost turner to aerate that that uh, headland stack or that windrow on the end of the edge of the field. These areas, uh, when we site them, we're usually looking for areas that maybe are high traffic areas that don't have the yield potential. Um, therefore, you're not necessarily taking land out of production that, that could be a net gain to your farm operation or your, your feed needs. The compost turner, uh, obviously you need to introduce that oxygen and, uh, and liquidate the waste gases uh, to allow the composting and speedy decompensation. The composting process, how are we going about composting on our farm as of, as of today? And I guess the, the main thing is uh, uh, when we compost on our farm, we do, do it two ways. We do some of it on a controlled environment under a roof, and we do some on, on outside pad, um, cement pad, uh, where we uh, are a little bit more exposed to the elements of, of, uh, of the weather. And uh, to the picture to the right, I got actually got a, caught a bald eagle uh, checking in on what we were doing uh, one day. Uh, I thought it was kind of kind of interesting. Uh, he must have seen it from a bird's eye view and had to take a closer look. So there is, there is interest in composting out there. And uh, uh, even this fellow was willing to check it out. Where can you compost? Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the uh, compost is, we are doing it under a roof uh, and that roof is uh, um, not cemented underneath. It's a three foot of clay uh, base that uh, was built for this specifically, NRCS approved. Um, and then we also do an outside composting pad uh, that we uh, have a little bit more more material than what we can do under the roof. That's our, our overflow. Um, both work well, uh, both have some challenges. I do see a couple questions here. Uh, well, first one being, uh, any permits needed uh, for in, in nutrient management plan. And um, no, uh, we, we are actually allowed to do up to 4,500 yards in one particular site if you do it on headland stacking based off of NRCS rules. And was there any analysis done of the microbe comp composition of the finished compost? Uh, we have not yet. We do have some I do have some tests of uh, trace elements within the compost on the fertility side. Moving forward, here's another example of where you compost. Now, some of these trials we were doing out in the fields Here's an uh, example of field edge uh, windrows that were in the field. And if you look at the fields, there is no, uh, in the field here in the grass growing next to the compost, you're not seeing any signs of leaching or burning of the grass um, that's coming out of these windrows. The types of manure that we are now putting into our compost, 
Um, on the left hand side, we've got the freestall scraping. So that's the the manure that we are actually taking to the digester right now. Uh, that's you can see it's got a um, a little bit of a slump to it. It's not straight water by no means. Um, we can handle it with the the tractor loader uh, bucket. We can load it uh, with the tractor loader. We it's not pumpable, um, so it actually works quite well for the the uh, digester uh, manure. We're actually taking a fair amount of methane capability within that manure because it is a little on the thicker side. That helps offset some of the costs of transportation uh, to make it uh, viable. Bedding pack manure, that's our main carbon source. That's where a lot of the energy is coming from to make the compost. Here's a picture of the separated solids. Notice that's, that's very stackable. That's the the separated um, solids parts that come out of the, the liquid that goes to the, to the digester. When we build our windrows, we are loading the different types of manure. And what you're seeing here in this picture is um, the, tr the tractor or the spreader that we load this, uh, this, um, manure into is kind of a multi-facet machine for us. That, that same spreader is used to haul the manure, the scrapings to the digester on a daily basis, hauls the fiber back, also builds, helps us build the windrows as well as spread the finished compost. So we're, this machine we're getting a lot of use out of on our farm, uh, very important when you add the extra steps to the composting process um, so that you have, that you're not adding a lot of equipment costs that's not being used. The, um, the loader, then we load the three different, the two ingredients system, we're really only using two ingredients here now is the bedding pack manure. Um, and the separated solids. After that's loaded in the spreader, um, the mix we are using right now is three parts fiber, one part uh, bedding pack. We then build our windrows. So you can see this, we back the spreader up to the windrow, open the back gate, and as we spread it, it makes this perfect pyramid, uh, this, 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 uh, that is uh, basically what we want to make uh, a good compost windrow or, or to start the composting process. Uh, we get a good mix of these two materials uh, early on. We're, we don't have to turn it to get this mix. Uh, usually we are building a windrow a week. We are finishing a windrow a week uh, based on the amount of manure we have. And um, so this, this windrow, will sit for about a week before it gets actually turned with the compost turner. Once we start the compost turning uh, process, uh, we'll turn uh, um, usually weekly. We will hit that sweet, sweet spot of uh, when we've got good temperatures, we'll turn five times in the matter of uh, uh, two weeks process to maintain that 135 degree temperature at all times. Here's a, a site of the finished compost. We've got compost outside here. You can notice the strength, the, the, the color, the size of uh, the reduction, uh, obviously in volume. Uh, and then under the shed roof here or the compost building, the windrow farthest to the right is the one that's the closest to finish. And the other two are, um, you know, got a couple weeks to go yet. Transportation and staging of the compost. So um, our farm, we, we have land that varies uh, from two miles to 10 miles from the home farm. So we have to transport some of this compost 
some a fair distance. And when we do it, we try to load it as efficiently and haul it as efficiently as possible, haul it to the field that's going to get spread on. So when we get into that field to spread it, that we're not wasting any time, that we're basically loading and spreading and uh, making full um, uh, efficiency of both the loader and the spreader when we go into the spreading process. But here on the right-hand side, you can see what a windrow looks like in the field um, this time of the year. Uh, scrape away the snow um, so we can put it on basically on top of the dirt. And in our situation, we don't take it to, uh, to a finished compost state like you'd put in a bag. So it will heat a little bit yet out in the field. And uh, I guess you could say it, it can condition it or, or just do the last finishing in the field. And then the spreading. Uh, here you see the same machine. Um, we put spinners into the, onto the back of the spreader, um, able to spread up to about 80 feet uh, real consistently with the spreader. And this picture shows us spreading it on a uh, grassy hay field. And uh, the biggest thing that I've noticed when we're spreading compost is that you don't paint the ground like you do with when you're typically hauling uh, manure with like a slinger spreader or um, or a box spreader. It just you don't have the you don't have the volume to do that, but yet you're getting probably as much nutrients, if not more, onto the field and being a lot less visible visible uh, for the by span the public as well. Any questions here or some questions to catch up on? Okay. How do your costs compare to the tr traditional soil management? So one of the, what we're finding is here is that we're actually, uh, we're gonna get into it a little bit later, but uh, our nutrients, um, I can haul the compost to the field uh, much further than I can liquid manure and to get the value out of it. So uh, for instance, a load of compost on a straight truck could probably worth about 600 bucks in fertilizer value. The same payload in liquid might be about 65 to $80 a load. So therefore I can haul that nutrients further before the value of that of that nutrients is gone. Um, we also are seeing a reduction in the amount of fertilizer we have to put onto the purchase and put onto fields because we are better utilizing the nutrients within the farm system. The challenges with winter composting is moisture. Um, and that's one of the questions here as well. And we tend to, to uh, in our, our setup here, was we try to go in with drier uh, carbon sources to begin with, if, if possible. Um, our compost generally runs higher in moisture in the winter months. Um, there are some uh, opportunities out there to put aeration under the windrows uh, if you wanna spend the money. Uh, we turn more often in the winter. Uh, we, uh, we also uh, try to um, uh, do it in a way that um, the, the moisture leaves the pile. So I don't like to turn on days where, where it's cold, real cold, if we don't have to, uh, just so that moisture gets away from the pile. Uh, the NPK analysis of the finished compost, I'm going to share that a little bit later. We have some variation. We have some carbon nitrogen ratios that I'll be sharing later as, and, uh, as well. So now the economics. This is probably, this is something that's really important to understand. And we, 
we performed some economics early on with the community composting grant. I went through this winter and I've kind of updated that to what we're able to be, how those economics are working for our farm right now, um, now that we've ramped up our, our production. So if you look at the cost analysis of traditional manure handling, uh, we have, here we have a um, chart or a cost breakdown in a couple of different categories. I'm gonna start with the top one here. So in this cost analysis, we've actually took the value of the, of the bedding stock or the bedding that was going into the manure and the amount of bales and so forth. And in this case, it showed it was $504 in value. That's probably gone up a little bit. Uh, um, this particular cost analysis was done on basically 467 cubic yards of bedding pack uh, manure coming out of the facility. Um, we go down to the actual costs of scraping and cleaning the barn and the labor. Uh, and then we look at the total cost of the manure. So the total cost to clean out that barn and build the windrows in this situation, uh, or yeah, we're just cleaning the barn, I should say, in this cost scenario and hauling it directly to the field. So the total cost was over $3,000, um, but the cost per yard was $6.51. So that's what it would typically cost to, in our, if we would be hauling this, cleaning this barn and hauling it directly to the field. Um, and that's more of the typical way of, of handling bedding pack manure. If we add the com compost process to it, you know, we're going to, we've got the turning expense. We have the, or we should actually have the facility cost. Um, so, um, and then we have the cost of the turner and the top box here. Uh, loading the compost at the barn, again, to move it further out. Uh, reloading the compost on the Tebby spreader for spreading. Um, that's what we figured the cost there. Total cost. The total cost to produce, haul, and spread the compost was like 4800 and seventy-seven dollars. You'll notice on the page before it was right around three thousand dollars just to haul it directly to the field. If we take that on a on a on a uh, per cubic yard uh, price to spread the compost to the field, at that time we were estimating it was costing twenty-one dollars and seventy-seven cents per cubic uh, yard to. Uh, to haul or to make and haul that compost on the field. If we were to load that compost and not take it to the field and just sell it, we were figuring the cost, net cost of production would be about 1897. So 1897, uh, if we convert that to uh, per ton cost, uh, because most of our analysis are done on a per ton ba uh, basis for when you send your compost off to get an, an analysis on it comes back. The nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium are tabulated a, as a per ton basis. Uh, being that a yard of compost doesn't weigh a ton, it comes out to $32.31 per, per ton spread on the field under this scenario. If we were to just uh, uh, sell it uh, and put it on a truck, it would be twenty nine eighteen a ton uh, for those costs. So those those costs have to be made up somewhere. So the compost uh, comparison, direct haul to the field versus finishing compost, we are seeing about six dollars right now, six dollars and fifty cents a yard to convert the manure into compost or $10 a ton 
for the finished compost. More, it's costing ten dollars more a ton to do it if rather than just haul it directly to the field. Now, some cost analysis based off of where we are today. Now, at now, as of now, as you. The shed, the interest, depreciation, and principal. I figured I based this all on a per yard basis. I figured it was two forty four. Uh, building the compost windrow, that would be um, as I showed you in the pictures earlier. The loading of the manure, the different ingredients onto the spreader, and running it back out. Uh, I figured it's about two dollars per yard. Turning the compost eight times, uh, two dollars and fifty cents per yard. Loading the finished compost for field spreading or sale. Uh, we have, we're a little more efficient with that now. We got a bigger loader, uh, $1.50 per yard. So our totals as of what we're making now is about $8.44 per yard to make it into compost. Just to make the compost and load it. The cost of spreading the compost, we figure up to two miles, which is $3.80 per yard. So therefore, we've got it delivered and spread to the field for $12.24 a yard, or $18.83 per, per finished ton. Cost analysis then versus now, we're looking at 32 tons, uh, uh, $32.31 a ton spread on the field uh, versus the $18.44 per ton for now. So here, we're, here we are looking at a value uh, of the compost. That's the question there. What are the NPs and Ks? Uh, in this situation, this, uh, this was done in 2016 um, on a per ton basis. On this particular analysis, we figured the value of the nitrogen uh, was $12.87 per ton. The phosphorus was $6.92 per ton. The potassium was $7.99 per ton. The sulfur was $1.51 a ton. Calcium was 505 per ton. Magnesium was 350 per ton. And then if you take all the others, less significant numbers for analysis, but still important to the crop, the boron, the zinc, the copper, the magnesium, the molybdenum, um, this, the total value of that compost comes up to 4179 per ton. So there is still some extra value above and beyond the production uh, for that, that particular compost. There is a difference in compost. Um, now here, we've been playing around with different feedstocks going into the compost. Some are create higher compost uh, numbers than others. Moisture has a lot to do with it. Uh, if you look at the upper left-hand column here, we've got a compost sample that runs 69% moisture. That's a little on the high side. You're looking at the nitrogen at 9, uh, 9.39 per ton, uh, total phosphorus at 8.54 a ton, potassium 9.94, and sulfur 1.79. You take the sample in the lower right-hand corner, now this is 41% moisture, considerably drier. All of a sudden with the feedstock in this particular case, we've got nitrogen at 3181. We got phosphorus at 2846 and potassium at 5616 and sulfur at 783. Um, there's a couple things that could play into this. The carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, obviously the moisture is number one. The carbon to nitrogen ratio of the first sample is 14 to one. The carbon to nitrogen ratio of the second sample is 11 to one. So the one in the lower right is more finished and drier. 
uh, the feedstock going into it might have been higher in N, P, and K to begin with as well. So that's why now in our um, recipe, we've kind of got it zeroed in to just that three, three to one ratio. Then we, uh, we got a more consistent product coming out. Um, that also has been made better because we are making our windrows with the, with the spreader uh, versus a loader tractor. We have a much better job of having a consistent windrow from end to end. We don't have that inconsistency of maybe we have a hot spot in, in the middle of the windrow where it got a little bit more of this uh, higher, higher uh, uh, fertility feedstock to begin with. And all of a sudden we pulled a sample out of, out of that area. So we're more, we're more consistent now than, than we were previous. Compost analysis is by the season. So what this is, is what is, how are our compost uh, testing by the season? The one on the left, I think, does that break down? Yep. Um, you have the average moisture, the actual high. So this is a series of samples. We sample every windrow. So we took the high windrow and the low windrow, and then we have an average. So if you got the moisture content, you know, the average is 56, uh, organic matter 24, pH 9.5. Our pHs seem to run a little bit higher, even on the real finished compost. Uh, and then you can see the averages for the N, P, and K. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see uh, how the nitrogen and ammonium and uh, the organic N and so forth and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, spring now, the spring compost would be the compost that would be being made right now in the months of January and February. Uh, the summer compost would be basically the compost that's being made in early spring. And then the fall compost would be uh, the compost that's being made in the summer. And the winter compost would be what is being started in the fall. If you look at the summer compost, um, the moisture goes down 6%. Uh, we have um, a little bit higher uh, um, numbers as far as the potassium. Uh, nitrogen is down. Uh, this, this particular case, the phosphorus is, is a little bit lower. But then that spring compost, we had an we had a ingredient in that uh, high one that really pushed the phosphorus. So that one's a little, uh, uh, a little out of whack there. So um, again, then on the bottom, um, in this particular case, uh, we didn't have uh, as much of a breakdown on the organic N, and, but the total carbon or the carbon nitrogen ratio was 13.26 uh, for an average. We take the fall now. Uh, here, here's the, that material that's being made in the summer. Notice it's drier on an average. We had a high of 56 and a low of 38. Um, if you look at those numbers, um, we have a variation there. Uh, uh, pH again is still um, still up there. Um, nitrogen on the high one was pretty high. Um, the phosphorus is is relatively high on the high one as well. But uh, um, if if we can duplicate that in a mix, now we got something that we can justify hauling even further out than, than uh, uh, your standard compost. So there are ways to, to uh, spice this compost up a little bit to have a little more value in it uh, based on the feedstock that's going in it and how we treat it. Again, on the bottom carbon to nitrogen ratio on these, we're averaging 11.47. Now winter. There's the moisture. There's our big, that's my biggest challenge is the winter 
compost is dealing with the moisture and not having that pile go stagnant on us. And 68 is getting up there. Um, I always uh, kind of fall on the rule of thumb that making compost is like making silage. Uh, if it's too wet, it doesn't work well in the ration. If it's too dry, it doesn't work well in the ration. So if you can keep it somewhere between 55 and 65, you've got a really good working range. Um, here you can see the averages on that. Uh, you know, our high had a had a carbon to nitrogen ratio at the bottom of 16.36. That's probably not finished real well. That was 72% moisture. That's probably why. Uh, the one that was 61 had a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 11.2. That's more acceptable. And, uh, you know, the average was 13.83. No, that was a lot of stuff. Do we have any questions on that? Okay. Okay, so are the carbon to nitrogen ratios from start or end of the compost process? So carbon to nitrogen ratios on ours are usually start around at 30. 30 to one when it's fresh made in the windrow. Um, we always kind of figure the way we're using it out in the field, not necessarily selling it as uh, class A compost. Anytime it's below 15 to one, I feel um, it's time to move it out. Uh, we are, we're getting the value of the, the, uh, uh, pathogen kill at that point. We have a pretty good carbon number there. Um, the shrink is there. Um, and we just, I just don't want to uh, uh, put any more time and money into it than I absolutely have to. If I was to sell the compost, uh, we would probably then have to uh, spend a little more time with it. The ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio is, um, from what I understand, is anywhere 15 and lower. It's very hard to get carbon to nitrogen ratios uh, under 10. So when she's getting down to that 11 range, you've got a pretty good finished compost. Uh, that's when it's really black in color. The texture is, is uh, particle size is real small. Uh, it's got that real earthy smell. Um, those are what that's to me is some of the best, uh, based on the visual and the smell. Uh, can you explain about the compost turner? I would like to know what model you use to have it custom built. <laughs> so our compost turner that we built, um, uh, it is, it, it does a complete turn. Of the, of the compost, um, we back into the compost. It's air, uh, there's a beater that uh, flings it up in the air and onto a conveyor belt that restacks it. And this, uh, this turner, I, I can't talk too much about it. I'm, I'm in the process of potentially patenting this turner, um, but uh, it's been working quite well for us. And I think Part of the reason we're able to do some of the things we're doing uh, in a timely fashion is because of the Turner itself. Uh, the question here is, I don't see any line in your cost analysis for the cost of not turning soluble N and P into the insoluble or into other words, taking organic N and P and turning it into organic, therefore making it insoluble until root uh, extractuates, call for it real value. Yeah, and that one, um, that's true, but how do you come up with that number? That's one of some of the things that we still have to, that I don't quite understand yet. Maybe some of the people that are listening in maybe have some answers because uh, there are definitely some hidden values there that we are, do not uh, label in our numbers. 
a question here is I came in late. What do you see as a carbon? What, what do you, oh, what do you use as a carbon source to manage your carbon to nitrogen ratio? Um, our main carbon source in our, in our compost here is corn stalks. Um, actually bedding pack manure taken right out of the, out of the, out of the barn and with uh, either straw or, or corn stalks has the almost the perfect nitrogen carbon to nitrogen ratio to start the composting process. All right, caught up on the questions. Yeah, we're gonna move on to the next section. We got another one. Uh, what equipment used to measure the temperature for legal compost? Um, I am just taking temperatures at this point right now. Um, we'll probably have to invest into some more sophisticated equipment if we are actually going to start marketing compost. Uh, but I'm pretty much falling back on temperatures and uh, watching temperatures to make sure we're turning in a timely fashion. And then when temperatures tend to drop and the carbon to nitrogen ratio um, uh, goes down, um, that's what we're basing our our time to, to move it out or finish turning. Conclusion. As I was saying, composting unknown value. And here's a list of things that we don't know. And I have a hard time putting a handle on. What is the value of adding compost to the soil for soil health purposes? So we know by taking compost to the southern part of the watershed um, back in 2015 and 16, the farmer applied four ton to the, to the acre at that time, a one-time application. The for, from that point the following year, it's moving forward up until this year even, he's seen a yield bump in the area within the field where he spread the compost. Um, and soybeans and corn both were, you know, pushing close to 10 bushels to the acre uh, at the high. He was still seeing a couple bushels this year. So there's something going on in the soil there by introducing compost. And it's not just the, the, the N, P, and K, that carbon and, and organic matter and, and the biology of that compost is doing something uh, significant. And I am open to anybody that has any more information on that uh, that could share with us. And, and it's definitely something we'll be working on here closely uh, with trials to come to see if we can um, actually figure out what's happening. Uh, what is the value of the additional carbon from the compost uh, added back to the soil when you spread it? How do we put a number on that value? And what is the value of the organic makeup of the compost when compared to conventional fertilizer? Um, obviously this farmer was using conventional fertilizer. He was getting good yields. Um, we introduced the compost to it. And within a year's time, he had even better yields. So there's definitely something going on there. Better utilization of nutrients in the farm system. I talked about that earlier. How do we, how do we uh, uh, utilize, best utilize the nutrients that we have paid for on the farm um, and sharing it from field to field? Uh, convenience of the value of moving and staging manure to farm fields before hauling. This time of the year, we don't, I shouldn't say we don't have a lot to do, but we have, we have a little more time to actually stage that manure, get it to those fields, taking the transportation part out of the equation uh, at the time when you need to be out there spreading. The ability to manage bedding pack manure all months of the year. Um, that was a challenge for us. Uh, you know, uh, when you have bedding pack barns that need to be cleaned out in the summer months, um, it's, you've, you're limited on fields where you can spread it. You can't spread it on hay fields. Uh, you'll smother out the alfalfa or the grass. Um, you take the potential of reharvesting it again. Uh, therefore, composting and breaking it down uh, allows us to do that. 
uh, select days for hauling that are best for the field conditions. Right. There's a value there. Uh, you're not out there compacting the soil. Uh, you can pick your dry days um, or or days when the uh, the weather is is uh, better for spreading uh, manure or nutrients out on the field. Spreading manure compost on fields that won't have received manure. There are fields on our farm that if because of the landscape that we cannot put liquid manure on. Uh, it just, it's too hard. Uh, we do most of our liquid manure application in the form of drag lines. You get on some of these steep fields and it's hard to pull a hose on a steep field uh, with their high slopes. It makes some challenges, problems with potential of uh, kinking hoses and things like that. Allows for redistribution of nutrients within the farm system to all fields, as I talked about. Cons of composting. Costs, costs more to compost. Um, you know, even though it come only doesn't look significant, but $6.50 a yard or $10 a ton um, doesn't seem all that big. But if you put four ton to the acre on, all of a sudden you're looking at $40 an acre more. Uh, to to put that nutrients out in that field, that same nutrients. Granted, it's in a different form, probably more usable. Those are the types of things that we have to be able to offset the expenses of the production uh, some way, somehow to justify the extra time and the commitment uh, 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 for, for the composting process. Time, time commitment is, is big. It takes time to to uh, stage this manure, takes time to make the windrows, takes time to turn the manure. Um, some farms don't have that time, that labor force, some do. The nice thing about the turner that we are working with here on our farm is it's completely mobile. Some of our trials we're do it working with, with farmers, uh, we uh, were as far as five miles away, we we're able to uh, move that turner with the tractor in a minimal amount of time to turn their windrows. So there's a potential that that compost um, turning and making could be um, could be a, a um, custom uh, custom applic application or a custom customly done uh, by somebody that wants to move from farm to farm um, if it picks up and in uh, popularity. Equipment and facility costs. Um, the equipment isn't cheap, the spreader isn't cheap, the turner isn't cheap. Uh, we have, uh, we, we have uh, most of our manure, manure is being composted under the, the roof, the more of a controlled environment. I believe it's, that's well worth it. Uh, the consistency of the product coming out uh, saves in time potentially if you have a, uh, a windrow that goes uh, dormant on you halfway through the process, uh, being outside, if you get a heavy rain or something, uh, then you you got to either introduce more carbon to it or you have to wait it out to get revitalize that compost windrow. So it takes a little bit of that risk away with the facility cost. Uh, lack of equipment and availability. Um, when I started looking for compost turners that would work well in our in our shed, uh, that's what brought me to the idea of building a compost turner. I think uh, we we the uh, the equipment uh, that is needed at a farm level is uh, is is maybe not there. Uh, yet, or maybe it's coming. Uh, seems like most of the compost turners that were out there were either too big for what we wanted or, or too small. Weather challenges in this region. Um, northern, you know, we're, we're in the southern part of Wisconsin. Uh, we have some cold weather in January and February, as we well recognize here coming out of the the cool weather we had here recently, uh, those challenges um, add to, that adds a challenge to the compost uh, process, especially when you're in the deep freeze. I don't like the turn if I don't have to in those those uh, 
uh, temperatures because it seems to thin out my my uh, bug count or my bacteria count, the good bacteria. I also am turning frost and moisture back into the windrow that normally would be volatilized up in the air. Ability to dissipate the moisture into the, the compost in the winter months, just talked about that. Um, getting that moisture to actually leave that windrow. Uh, if we're gonna do this in a large scale, um, we may have to introduce some form of uh, ventilation or uh, air in the floor systems uh, to potentially drive that moisture away from the windrows <coughs> at this time of the year. What we have learned, uh, we have learned uh, that uh, we have the ability to make a high quality compost product. Um, you know, we've, we've got some compost that's very high value um, depending upon the feedstocks. That's a matter of zeroing in on your recipes and your, your sources to, to make a consistent product. Uh, compost process works well if you have raw products and multiple types of manure. Uh, we, are, we have proven that. Uh, we've even taken it one step further, as I've talked to you earlier about, with some of the Class A product coming out of the Madison Metropolitan Sewer District. Can shrink manure volume considerably by composting. Uh, as I, we've seen anywhere from 40 to 60% in volume uh, reductions. Uh, that's huge when you got to offset the costs of the extra time and investment to make compost can make nutrients much more available and stable for composting with composting versus conventional pack manure. Um, I think we've seen that in our, what we've seen out in the field with our yields. Uh, we've, we definitely know that if you haul a lot of uh, straw and, and corn stock, uh, carbon base, fresh manure out in the field that it can sometimes suppress a, um, the uh, the yield or or potential of that crop that year just because of the tying up the nutrients that's in the soil by break to break down the carbon in that manure. Uh, we can spread product on growing crops, alfalfa grass. We even did some on soybeans last year for a farmer. That's that's a positive can transport nutrients further in the form of compost before the eco economic value of the product becomes a net loss. Can manage processed manure on field edges. Uh, it's perfectly legal to do that. Um, it's a good way of uh, saving some time and at the hauling time. We can dispose of livestock mortalities. I started out my presentation and that's where we learned what composting was all about, so to speak, was working with, with the mortalities and how it shrinks, how you're able to uh, uh, decompose that, that mortality and that, that windrow of, of manure and, and, and uh, shrink, shrink that manure at the same time. Uh, pretty uh, safe and efficient way to uh, limit yourself to exposure to other diseases and pathogens with the with the rendering truck coming onto the farm. Can reintroduce carbon back to the farm fields in the form of compost. Um, that's uh, that's a given. Can mix other things with compost. Um, you know we can we can potentially add lime, uh, wallboard, uh, municipal mixes um, that. That is important. That spreader that I, I have here and it showed you on the screen has the potential of spreading lime. Um, you could mix lime with your compost on a field that you wanted to seed into alfalfa and, uh, and spread the lime and the compost at the same time. A uh, lot of wallboard down in this area with the amount of housing and uh, building in, in this region, the southern part of the state has a lot of gypsum in it, um, some value in that. In our watershed here, the municipal uh, municipality sewer districts, they're, they're, they've got a challenge. They, they're actually competing with farmers for land to spread the human waste on. 
there might be a potential to co-mingle our products to make a product that works uh, for for the farmers and and work together. Could that's a possibility? It may not fit the organic world, but it might fit the conventional systems. Convert soluble phosphorus from raw manure into more stable particulate form through the composting process. We've we've uh, seen that in our uh, work with the uh, with the university and and the community grant. What we need to learn: How does finished compo compost interact with the soil? Um, I guess that's something that I would really like to get into more depth now and understand what's happening in those farm fields when we put that compost out there. Can compost be another saleable commodity coming off the farm and off our waste stream? So if if we if we can and I and my I have a enough um experience with this now that I feel that it can be. Um, I think it I think that would be very, very important for the future of, of the livestock industry if we can uh, somehow make a product coming off of our waste stream that could form an, another form of income. Uh, there's farms out there that need that organic fertilizer and they need those nutrients. So how much compost do we need to put on per acre to, to get the benefits of the, that you need in the soil, uh, that kick, so to speak, uh, to get that kick? Uh, is it four ton? Is it maybe a thousand pounds? If it's a thousand pounds, I've got all kinds of compost that I can share with people. If I need to continue putting four to five ton on my hay fields, then maybe, maybe I don't. We can pool resources to engage a larger number of farmers. I mean, can we do this? Um, I'm starting to think we can. Um, it's just a matter of how does that all work and how can we work together to do that? How much compost is needed to, apply to be applied to obtain maximum soil health benefits? I just touched on that a little, little bit early, but uh, what is that? Um, what is that magic number? How much compost do we need to apply per acre to get the full value of compost working in the soil? Can the rest be marketed? And that's, that's the bottom line. Why manage manure by composting? Any size farm can successfully compost. Um, that's, that's been proven. Better utilization of nutrients in the farm system. Uh, I've talked about that a number of times. Mobilization of nutrients needed in specific fields. Um, you know, and I do my own SNAP Plus or nutrient management planning, and, and I got a pretty good handle on fields that are low on phosphorus and need phosphorus. I try to build those fields uh, within the system with the phosphorus that's in the compost. Um, get the nutrients to the fields that are highly erodible. Um, tend to be the hardest ones to get the manure spreader to or the drag line to. Um, some of them fields aren't getting corn that is often, so it's hard to hit them on a regular basis. Uh, liquid manure storage, costly to store, hauling becomes uh, because of the volume. Um, no, no secret in that. I mean, um, manure structures are costing more and more year, every year that goes by to build. Um, and how can we shrink that again to shrink that volume of manure uh, so that when we put wheels under it, that it's more concentrated and, and more uh, um, condensed uh, so that we can um, move it move it out more efficiently and further. Allowed to headland stack and stage compost on fields in winter months when liquid manure can't be spread. Um, those headlands don't, aren't costing you much more than the taxes in the winter months for them to be sitting there on the farm field. Might as well make use of them. Uh, some of these uh, field edge, uh, 
you know, tree line areas. Uh, they're not growing the best crops to begin with. Maybe we should be utilizing them for staging our nutrients out there earlier. Pathogen removal. Another one, how do we put a value on that? But, um, but uh, that is the reason I, it, that we should be composting. It kills, kills a number of, of uh, pathogens, uh, allows for spreading on growing crops, and then reduces that potential uh, for disease, disease spreading. An example would be like yonis. Uh, our herd is pretty well eradicated uh, yonis. Um, and we've been able to do it with, uh, with good management practices. And I guess we're at the point here where we can field a few more questions and maybe even have some dialogue. So, uh, so the first question, in other words, what is the benefit or not containing the groundwater and surface waters with P and N? Would you not agree that it is priceless? Yeah, I agree it's, it is, uh, but even though it's priceless, somebody has to pay for it and there's a cost to it. So, um, you know, my farm, this is, there is no doubt about it. I am spending more money on our farm making compost right now than if I was directly hauling that material to the field. And so um, to ask other farmers to do the same thing, we really got to know the benefits and the values of those things so we can justify um, making the change. And the things that lead to um, better soil health and better um, utilization of nitrogen and, and the nutrients within the compost, all those things are win-wins. I always call them the win-wins. And when you win for the environment and you win for the farmer's bottom line, those are easy to adopt and adapt to. But the, the ones that uh, that are just flat cost to the farm, them are harder to sell. Would not an easy justification for added cost be the simple fact that 70% of your non-composted nitrogen from the manure is leaching to the groundwater? Only 30% plant utilization, 100% of nitrogen in your compost is being utilized by the plant. Huge. I would agree. Um, being able to have that in an organic form, um, a slow release, um, and tying it up, I think, is big. Um, those are things, those are the messages that need to be told with this. What is the width, length, and height of your windrows. Our windrows generally start out at about six to seven feet high. The width at the bottom is about 12 feet. Um, generally when they're done more, more on the finished side, they shrink down to about three feet. Um, and, and in some cases we actually combine windrows to keep, uh, to keep the composting uh, uh, process going um, a little longer. Is there any thought to compost some or slash all the milking cow manure? Um, the challenge that I would have with the milking cow manure is, is the excess water that's in the liquid manure from a dairy cow. Dairy cow drinks a lot of water, so she's, she's putting out a lot, of, a lot of moisture in her manure. Um, there are some facilities in Europe where they're where they are taking liquid manure and and high volumes of water in it and are composting it. I not up to speed on them. I don't know the particularly the answer, um, but I know the more things that I have to build and add to the farm, the more costs that's going to be for, for, for doing it. So um, if we can do it someday, I'm sure we will. Uh, it's a work, in our case, it's a working progress. What effect does your composting process have on greenhouse gas emissions? Well, that's a good question. Um, so there's no lie there. We're, we're emitting some greenhouse grasses through, gases through the composting process. Um, now, 
there is the potential of adding some some things to the compost that could alleviate some of that. Um, I'm going to be working with some people moving forward on that idea. I can't reveal what the product is yet, but we are going to be testing that. So anytime we can keep some niter excess nitrogen into that compost, um, that should help with the volatilization of greenhouse gases. What is the size of your building and how many yards and tons can it handle? So our building is 65 for 60 by 220. I have four windrows in there at a time. I always figure a windrow per foot, approximately a ton, uh, a ton, half, a third of a ton per foot. The building is actually quite high. It's, I think it's 16 or 17 feet to the truss height. That gives us plenty of room to use the spreader, open the end gate in there and not hit the bottom of the trusses.